once your enemy now seated at your table Jesus Jesus thank you we say that with our hearts Lord thank you so much that the wrath of God is satisfied on the cross because of what you have done we thank you that we can come into your presence father that we can call you Abba father because of what Jesus has done thank you again thank you for the things that you have done thank you that one day this whole earth would be renewed and restored back to its original place to its to what it was meant to be because of what you have done thank you that we get to be part of this grand story that you were writing across the world Lord Jesus I thank you father for your people who are gathered here today uh, would you encourage hearts that are weary would you lift up people who are weary and are burdened uh, because of sin because of the indwelling presence of sin that we carry with us uh, remind us again that today we no longer have to carry that because Jesus carried that for us and I pray father that you would give us eyes to see one more time how beautiful Jesus is to the preaching and teaching of your word uh, we invite you in the next few minutes Holy Spirit to speak to us to meet us where we are um, we need you and I acknowledge I need you would you please hide my pride so that it does not stand in the way of your people would you hide me and show Christ to your people show us Christ that we may go away today uh, having known more of him and what he has done for us with a greater appreciation for the grace that you have so lavishly poured out on us as your people we ask these things in Jesus name Amen Amen uh, I have a question for you who is Jesus to you uh, whether you have been walking with Jesus for a while or whether you are a you were, you're new to Christianity who is Jesus to you uh, how you answer that question uh, will radically affect your life uh, we have seen this in chapter 8 verse 28 where Jesus asked his disciples and said who do you say that I am uh, and here in our text uh, a man comes up to Jesus and calls him good teacher um, our perception of who Jesus is will radically affect how we live it will radically change how we live and so from our text uh, we are going to look at three insights uh, the first one is the treasures that cannot save us uh, number two the richest king who became poor for us number three the promise of a reward that awaits us let me repeat that the treasures that cannot save us number two the richest king who became poor for us number three the promise of a reward that awaits us number one the treasures that cannot save us verse 17 and as he was setting out on his journey a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him good teacher e sensei what must I do to inherit eternal life in verse 18 Jesus said to him why do you call me good no one is good except God alone verse 19 you know the commandments do not murder do not commit adultery uh, do not steal do not bear false witness do not defraud honor your father and mother and he said to them teacher all these I have kept from my youth and verse 21 Jesus looking at him loved him and said to him you lack one thing go and sell all that you have give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me verse 22 disheartened by the saying he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions notice it says a man uh, ran up to Jesus actually Matthew 19 20 says he's a young man uh, and Luke 18 18 says he's a ruler uh, and verse 22 down here says that he is also wealthy he had possessions and so this is a young influential respected and wealthy man 
And we also see that he is a spiritual man because he walks up to Jesus, right? He comes to Jesus and says, Good teacher, E sensei, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? See, uh, like in many other religions, other world religions, uh, this man sees Jesus as a good moral teacher. He sees him as a E sensei, a good sensei. He calls Jesus teacher, good teacher, right? But uh, he also sees eternal life as something that you can achieve as an inheritance. He uses the word, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, and, and here's how this uh, merit-based uh, mentality works in our cultures, right? Uh, there is a longing uh, in the hearts of people that says this, uh, what must I do to save myself from this horrible sense of inadequacy? Uh, what must I do to fill up this lack of fulfillment in my life? What must I do to achieve status, popularity, uh, fame, fortune, so that I can be a great somebody? What must I do to save myself from this internal sense of guilt and shame? What must I do to make up for this lack that is inside me that I sense every day? Uh, what must I do to gain a respectable status before my peers, before my friends, and, and before my co-workers? Uh, what must I do to succeed so that I can stand tall and be admired, so that I can be a somebody that the world can look up to and respect? And can I tell you that this man, this young man had all of that. Uh, yet unlike most people, he recognizes that there is a lack, a still a lack inside him. This is why he comes up to Jesus. He comes to Jesus and calls him good teacher with the hopes that Jesus has the answer to the longings of his heart. But notice Jesus' response in verse 8. This is classic. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, ironically, you see, Jesus was saying, why do you call me good? Are you saying that I am God? Because I am. This question is so counterintuitive, right? He's saying, why do you call me good? Are you, are you saying that I'm God? Because I am. I am God. Then he goes on to challenge his idea of goodness. Because see, in our cultures, we have these standards of goodness. If you perform better than your co-workers in your workplace, it makes you look down on those who perform, uh, uh, wh whose performances are weaker than you. That's the merit-based system. Correct? Right? And he goes on to challenge his idea of goodness in verse 19. Take a look there. He says, you know the commandments. Uh, that's the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Right? Have you stolen ideas from people? Uh, do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. In other words, uh, have you misrepresented the facts in your company, in your business dealings? Right? Honor your father and mother. And the young man replies in verse 20. He's quite confident. He says, Sensei, uh, all these commandments I have kept from my youth. <laughs> right? Uh, do you know why the crime rate in Japan is so low? One of the reasons, and I think this is one of the top reasons, most people have been raised to be very ethical since they're kids in Japan. This is a society that follows rules and therefore crime rate is low. See, despite all his performance as an ethical person, despite all his status as a ruler, uh, despite his influence as a wealthy man, this man lacks something and he realizes that. Uh, he probably went to the best university in Jerusalem. Uh, he probably didn't have problems finding a date because of his morality, his position, his wealth. Uh, if you are young and rich, you can dress up well, look good. You won't have problems dating, right? He doesn't have a problem finding out the most beautiful girl in the city and go on a date. He doesn't. This is a rich, young, ruler, influential, wealthy. He drives the best car. And he's moral. Who doesn't want to date this man? He's just very good. He's, he's the boyfriend that every mom, mom and dad dreams of. They would love their daughter to hang out with this gentleman, obviously. Right? He's a good rule keeper. He had never broken the law. Uh, he is spiritual. 
because he's been following the rules since he was a boy. That's what he says. Uh, he's quite aware of that, actually. He has money, he has position, uh, he has influence, he has achieved a certain level of uh, accomplishments, right? He's accomplished, he's a ruler in the local court at that time. And uh, in, he says, though, he says, Oh, Jesus, all these I have kept from my youth. What more is there for me? Show me what must I do to inherit eternal life. But look at him. There's something missing deep down in this man's life. So Jesus says this in verse 21. He says, you lack one thing. I love Jesus because he could see through the longings of this man's heart. And he says, I see that you lack one thing. He perceived that this young rich ruler was a rich guy. And he says, I see that you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have. Give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. That's what you lack. You lack treasure in heaven. Come follow me. You lack me. You need me. So here's a question. What is the one thing that he really lacks right here? Uh, what does the first commandment say in Exodus 20, chapter 3? You know this, church. You know this. What does it say? You shall have no other gods before me. Wow. So if you break the first commandment, you break everything else. Right? This, this guy climbed from below. He says, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. He got to the top. Finally figured out. Well, he fell short of it. He broke the first and thereby breaking all of the rest of the commandments. See, a, a very low view of God's law leads to moralism. Right? If you have a low view of God's law, it leads to moralism. Because why? You think you can keep it. So you feel proud like this young man when you think you have kept it. And you look down on others who, whose performances are weaker than you in your workplace. You compare. You think you're, top on, the, you're, you're on top of the leadership ladder in your company. Uh -huh. But you feel guilt, shame, and sorrow when you realize you can't keep it. That's exactly what happened to this young man. Verse 22 says, see, he went away sorrowful because he idolized his possessions. He idolized his possessions. My question to you, church, what do you treasure most in life? What do you trust most for your safety, security, and comfort? What does your heart trust functionally more than God himself? Because that's what the Shema, the Hebrew scripture says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Yet this man should have known that. He loved his treasure above God himself. His treasure was his God. What does your heart trust functionally more than God? We worship what we trust. Uh, we worship what we love most. Uh, if you love well, like for example, if you love well like this young man, he, if, you, if wealth is your treasure, see, it, it will pierce you with great sorrow. Uh, see, any good thing that we uh, make into an ultimate thing becomes an idol, a false god, a functional false savior. Right? Jesus is not saying, by the way, uh, rich people are bad and poor people are good. <laughs> He's not comparing, right? He's simply showing what this man's trust really is. Any good thing, including wealth, when we turn it into a God thing, it becomes an idol. See, if it captivates your imagination, uh, if it captivates your affections, you think about it all the time. Uh, you, you know, you, it, it, it just does not get away from your affections. You devote your affection to that thing. Your whole life, see, if you do that, it will lead to more and more emptiness. Even irreparable sorrow, as we see here. Le let me say this. Money is a great servant, but a terrible God. Money is a great servant, but a terrible God. See, the way you know, the way I know, okay, I'm a church planter. The way I know how that money has become my God is I'm overly anxious when the numbers in my bank account decreases. The, come on, am I the only one, right? Am I the only one who feels that way? The way you know that money has become your God is you're, you're obviously, you're, you're, you're overly anxious when the numbers in your bank account decreases. When the numbers in your bank account rises, you feel secure. Ah. Surely, right, that there is a real worry. You've got to pay the bills. Right? You can make all these external excuses. You have to pay the bills. Otherwise, they'll throw you out of your apartment. You have to pay your room rent. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you think about it all the time. It affects your daily lives. It worries you. 
it takes away your joy, then you know money has become your God. Then you know money has become your security, you see. It has become, become a functional false savior. Right? Uh, you feel secure so when there's money and you are worried, even depressed, when there's less money. See, if money has become your treasure, uh, your God, your idol, your anxiety level just goes up and down based on how much money you have in your account. Why is it that it's affecting you? It's controlling you. It's controlling your emotions. That's why you're anxious. This whole city is busy and anxious, running hard after money. Everybody's bank account rises and falls, and the minute, and when it rises and falls, it affects your emotions. It affects your hearts, your worries, because our hearts are attached to them. They are latching it itself on to money and treating it as a god thing. See, even your sense of worth, by the way, your sense of worth and identity rises and falls based on your income levels. You want me to prove it to you? Uh, uh, that's why people, uh, how many of you know Robert Downing Jr., right? Uh, Robert Downing Jr. is a famous movie actor. And his net, they, they say like this, they say Robert Downing Jr. is net worth $300,000 million and is ranked as one of the highest paid actors worldwide. They said he's ranked as the highest actors worldwide. In other words, money is an identity. Your sense of worth is tied so closely to how much you earn. That's the social status, right? So if your salary is lower than average, you're embarrassed because you find out, when people find out how much you earn, you feel kind of nervous to even talk about it because your sense of identity and worth is so tied to how much you earn. Your identity, your worth is close to how much income you make. Do you see this? Why this is a shallow foundation that we cannot build our identities on? Uh, see, you're placing in word, your worth and identity on your income level. That's why it's affecting your anxiety. That's why you can't sleep and you think about money all the time. Uh, see, Jesus is essentially saying here, look, you can save money, but money cannot save you. You can save money, but money cannot save you. So what is the one thing, right? What is the one thing that if you were to lose completely, would break your heart beyond repair? Scary question. What is the one thing that if you were to lose, would totally break your heart, devastate you like this man? Verse 22 says, Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The word uh, disheartened there, metaphorically, in the original language, is a sky covered with clouds. I love that. And the word sorrow means to grieve. Uh, see, the idols of his heart, his possessions, led to a very dark day, a cloudy day, not a sunny day. That is the imagery. It led to a very grievous, sorrowful day, not a joyful day. That's what idols do to us. They leave us wanting for more. They leave us depressed. They demand more sacrifices. The more you, demand, you sacrifice your life, your time, your energy to make more money, in the end, what it does to you, it leaves you anxious and sorrowful. It pierces you. That's what he's saying. His idol failed this man. Scary. Whenever, whenever you idolize something and, and latch yourself onto that, and when that fails you, it is scary. It leaves you sorrowful. Nothing is said more of this man in this story. But it doesn't have to be that way for us. It doesn't have to be that way. There is a better way. And here we see the richest king who became poor for us. Verse 23, and Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Here in verse 23 and 24, Jesus says of the rich man, how difficult it will be to enter the kingdom of God. Keep in mind, he says, enter the kingdom of God. Uh, most Jews at that time thought that possession of great wealth was a sign of God's blessing on your life. And this is why they were amazed when Jesus said that it is difficult for this wealthy man to enter the kingdom of God. But in verse 25, Jesus says this again. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus was simply using a comical uh, language to show how impossible it is to enter the kingdom of God. Look at verse 27. 
That's what he says. It is impossible with man, Jesus says. It is impossible without God. It is impossible without a miracle. It is impossible to enter the kingdom of God without grace. It is impossible with man. It is impossible to enter the kingdom of God. He's saying it will take a miracle for anyone to enter the kingdom of God and receive this eternal inheritance that I am offering. So in verse 26, they were asking, they were perplexed obviously, and they said, then who? Who can be saved? Have we been, have, haven't we been following you? Uh, the word saved there uh, means to deliver from the penalties of messianic judgment. So here's a question. Uh, how can you enter the kingdom of God? How can you inherit the eternal life? How can you inherit treasure in heaven? The answer is by receiving the one who was condemned for you. Look down with me to verse 33 and 34. Jesus says, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, that's Jesus, will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And verse 34, they will mock him, they will spit on him, they will flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. The only way to enter the kingdom of God is to receive Jesus who was condemned on your behalf. The only way to enter the kingdom of God is to receive the one who was rejected from the kingdom of God. On the cross, Jesus was cast outside of God's kingdom so that you can enter. Jesus became an outcast so we can enter. This is amazing, right? Jesus received the condemnation he did not deserve in order that we might receive the acceptance, the forgiveness we did not deserve. It says he will be condemned. He received the just condemnation that was coming upon us on our behalf. The richest king, the richest king became poor for your sake so that you might inherit eternal treasures. That's what happened there. Jesus is the richest king who became an outcast. He suffered as an outcast, the righteous condemnation from God for us so that we might enter into the kingdom of God. Much later, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, said this. He belabored this point. Look at me. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, that though he was the richest of the kings, yet for your sake, for you who have no treasures on earth, for you who have no treasures in heaven, for you who are spiritually poor, he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich eternally. In other words, if you're a believer, you're the richest person on the surface of this earth because Jesus made this possible for you. He earned these eternal treasures for you in heaven. And Jesus is the wealthiest king, see, who became poor for your sake so that you and I might be rich toward God. This is amazing. Jesus is the richest king who gave up his all for us so that we might inherit eternal riches. You never have to earn for these riches. Jesus earned it for you. He became poor for your sake. He emptied himself of all his riches. That's what he's saying. Jesus, the richest king, was willing to become an outcast for your sake so that you might enter into his kingdom and receive eternal treasures. So here's the thing, whenever the gospel of grace takes root in the heart of Christians, they overflow in giving, they overflow in generosity. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, the well-known 19th century uh, British preacher said this quote, maturity in grace makes us willing to part with worldly possessions. The green apple needs a sharp twist to separate it from the branch, but the ripe fruit parts readily from the wood. Let me repeat that. Maturity in grace makes us willing to part with worldly possessions. In other words, if you're growing in maturity in grace, you're not attached. Those things are no longer your idols. Jesus is your Lord. And therefore, you're not attached to it. You're bearing the fruit of generosity. Like an apple, 
right? That does not a green apple that does not need to be twitched. But you're like a ripe apple. You 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 part with your treasures easily. You bear the fruit of generosity because grace and generosity goes hand in hand. That's what Jesus, uh, Paul here is saying of Jesus, right? And that's what Charles Spurgeon says here. So here's the thing: if you want to know how God's grace, how deep God's grace has taken root in your heart, heart look at where your money goes. What you, what you do with your money shows you if Jesus is your Lord or if money is your Lord. Notice, he says, you know the grace of our Lord, right? What you do with your money shows you if Jesus is your Lord or money is your Lord. And see, this is amazing. Uh, like the rich young ruler, sometimes we struggle uh, some of you struggle to uh, give even 10% to God's kingdom, right? But look at the lavish grace of Jesus Christ. Look at what he has done for you. Jesus didn't donate 10% of his blood. He gave it all. He gave his all. He lavishly poured out his grace on the cross. He emptied himself. Look at the lavish grace of Christ until it melts your heart. L keep looking at it, gaze upon this until it really starts to melt your heart. He says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, he was the richest of the kings. He emptied himself of all his riches and died upon that wooden tree so that you, by his poverty, might have eternal treasures. This is amazing grace, right? He became poor for your sake so that you, by his poverty, will become eternally rich, spiritually rich on the inside. Uh, in other words, our giving will be in proportion to our understanding of the free grace of Christ. To the degree you understand how beautiful and how glorious this free grace of Christ is, to that degree you will be generous. You will overflow. You can't help but overflow. How can you not overflow? And see the beauty and the grandeur and the majesty of the grace of Christ. And how lavish, how generous this God is in pouring himself out. So Paul says, look at how much Jesus gave up for you. Look at how generous Jesus is. For you know, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was the richest of the kings, yet for your sake he became poor. He was willing to put on poverty. This is a glorious servant king. That's how he came to serve us. He emptied himself of his riches. He emptied himself of all his wealth on the cross so that we, by his poverty, might become rich eternally. So finally we see the promise of a reward that awaits us. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And verse 29, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel. Verse 30, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time and houses and brothers and in the life to come, eternal life. Right? This is remarkable. This is remarkable. In 28, Peter says, See, uh, the rich young man could not give up all his wealth and follow you, but we have, right? <laughs> he says, we have, right? Uh, his assumption is, so um, do we get a reward or something? <laughs> right? He still hasn't given up this earning mentality, does he? Right? So, so, and he's in the inner circle of Jesus. The scary part is that you think you can be in the inner circle and still miss out on the gospel. I happen to know this, right? So I, I'm, I'm a church planter. I've sacrificed everything. Like, what do I get? What do I get? Uh, or some of us feel this way, right? How many of you felt like if you serve Jesus sacrificially, you're going to miss out on something from this world? Ah. You start to feel like you're missing out on something because you're sacrificing for Jesus. Right? You have felt that way. I have felt that way. Have you ever felt like you're going to miss out if you give sacrificially and Jesus isn't going to take care of you? He, in Matthew 19, 27, Peter actually says this. See, we have left everything and followed you. What then we, will we have? <laughs> He's quite blunt. He says, what then will we have? 
Have you ever felt like no one seems to take notice of the sacrifices you've made in following Jesus? Jesus notices. That's why he says in verse 29, There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children or lands for my sake and for the sake of the gospel. Notice the motive. The promise applies if you make sacrifices for Jesus and his spread, the spread of the gospel. He says in verse 30, you will. That's a promise. I forget this promise. You forget this promise. But he's gracious to you. He's reminding his disciples and he's reminding us today. You will receive a hundredfold now in this time. From the time of my first coming until the second comes. Second coming, right? That is the now. Houses, brothers, sisters, and mothers, children, and lands with persecutions. <laughs> they didn't expect that. And in the age to come, eternal life. Because you start to get excited. And you start to think, oh, it's going to be great. Houses, he said. Oh, I would love a mansion. And then he says, with persecution. Right? It feels like a joy killer. But what happens? What is he saying? Jesus is saying, look. Comfort is more dangerous than persecutions. The idols of comfort will damn you to eternal hell like this young rich ruler. But persecution will sanctify you, will refine you, will make you Christ-like. That's why last week we heard in the sermon that the greatest danger in our context is not persecution, but material comfort. That is fighting with our souls, right? So what are the hundredfold blessings that he's talking about here? We'll close with this. Jesus is talking about spiritual riches that money can't buy. See, you can't buy mothers and brothers and sisters with money. These are the mothers and sisters and brothers and children, spiritual children. We gain in spreading the gospel in verse 30. That's why I call Chieko-san Okasan. I call Chieko-san mother because she's my mother in the Lord. We gain brothers and sisters and children. We gain a global family for following Jesus. The early disciples left everything and made great sacrifices for Jesus' sake and the gospel. They could not keep Jesus to themselves. How could they? After all that Jesus has done for them, right? So they left the comforts of their houses and family, as some of you have done. These, uh, they crossed lands and borders and cultures to take the gospel, and in the process suffered great persecutions. Um, by the time you read the book of Acts, the disciples were persecuted, and yet we see they gained many brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and children in the kingdom of God. They entered the kingdom of God and took some with them. They took many with them as they preached the gospel of this glorious grace of Jesus Christ. See? So how could they do it? How could they do it? Obviously, Jesus has died and risen again to make them his treasure. The richest king gave his all to, for your sake and for their sake. That's what motivated them to give themselves sacrificially, liberally, and generously for the spread of the gospel across the world. Right? They lived out what Matthew 13, 44 says. How many of you know that verse? It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man found then in his joy in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field in his joy when he saw the grace of christ poured out for him on the cross he rejoiced with joy inexpressible and full of glory he was so full of joy that everything else was not worth in comparison to the riches of what jesus has done for him on the cross that's what that man in matthew 13 44 saw they joyfully made sacrifices for the sake of the gospel because they knew they have eternal treasures waiting for them. Church, there are better things ahead that are waiting for you in Jesus Christ because of what he has done. We Christians are supposed to be the most joyful people on earth because there are better things ahead that are waiting for us. There are eternal treasures. Christ is king. He is seated on his throne. His kingdom will come in full. He will establish his church on earth. He will reign and rule and go 
governed this universe. He is sustaining us by the word of his power. His spirit is at work in you. And the gospel is applied to you. You are the richest of the people on this planet earth. So rejoice. Rejoice in Jesus and what he has done for you. Jesus will triumph. The story has been written out. We know the end of the story. Jesus will triumph. So therefore, church, why should we be depressed? Let's rejoice in what Jesus has done. Let's be a joyful church, right? Obviously, there are sufferings. We are not... Uh, uh, taking that lightly, Jesus is in. He's saying you will suffer persecution. But Paul says in Second Corinthians six, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as 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 poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet in possession of everything. You have everything in Jesus Christ that you need, and it's coming. Trust me, it's coming. That's what Jesus is saying to his disciples. There are better things ahead. And in the age to come, eternal life that the rich young ruler couldn't earn because Jesus earned it for you and me. This is amazing grace. They knew Jesus is better than everything else they had left behind. And they knew that they had something much better waiting for them in the age to come than all the things that they have left behind. See, the richest king became poor for our sake, so that we, by his poverty, might become rich. Our salaries are not just paychecks that we earn to hard works. They are gifts of grace that Jesus has entrusted in our hands. To be entrusted as a servant means we give them forward to the spread of his kingdom, the expansion of his kingdom, the spread of the gospel. This is what defines us as a church. Jesus is our treasure. There is no other treasure like him. And everything else we give flows out of this fact that we are, of all the people in the world, the richest people that you can count on, the richest people even when we are materially poor, we're the spiritually richest people anyway. This is a win-on-win -win situation. So would you stand up and pray with me as we close in prayer?